وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Seerah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. My name is Afifa Khwaja and thank you for joining us once again on Muslim Perspectives, a weekly program dedicated to bringing you news both at the local as well as the international levels. On our last program, we started a discussion about the holy month of Ramadan. On today's program, we have Brother Zafar with us once again to continue this discussion. Thank you, Brother Zafar, for being here today. Thank you, and it's my pleasure to continue to participate in this discussion so that we can bring some information to our brothers and sisters with respect to this very, very important month, uh, the month of Ramadan. So to get the ball rolling, let's first recap what exactly the Quran says about the holy month of Ramadan. Um, very good. I think um, uh, let's uh, once again uh, listen to the Quranic recitation, particularly with respect to these two very beautiful ayats uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah, ayat number 183 and ayat number 185, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all talks about uh, making fasting compulsory for us. Uh, and he also mentions that this was compulsory for people before us as well, other communities. And the purpose of Ramadan is that we achieve taqwa. And secondly, uh, the Quran then talks about the revelation of the Quran in the month of Ramadan. So let's listen to this recitation before we uh, continue our discussion. <laughs> Now, as we heard in this recitation, uh, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has made a fasting compulsory for us as it was for people before us so that we may achieve taqwa. So fasting is meant to enhance our taqwa. And taqwa is important, as we mentioned in our last program, because it is only when we have taqwa that we are able to get guidance from the Quran. Uh, secondly, taqwa is also important because 
that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to achieve so that we may achieve nearness to him. Mm -hmm. So taqwa means, like you know, actually it is taken from the Arabic uh, root word waqa or waqaya, which means protection. Uh, actually, that means that when we have taqwa, we fall under the uh, protective umbrella of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, what a beautiful concept, you know, that now we are under that protective umbrella and that's where we are protected from all kinds of um, evil, from all kinds of harm, and we are leading a life uh, which is uh, in conformity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. And the second aspect, of course, is that uh, it was in the month of Ramadan that the noble Quran was first revealed to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, again, uh, the month of Ramadan is linked with the revelation of the Quran and again a very important uh, you know, is issue for us. Um, as we mentioned in the verse a couple of minutes ago, Ramadan, sorry, fasting has been made compulsory for us. It is one of the five pillars of Islam. What year of Islam did this actually become compulsory for Muslims? Um, yes, Ramadan uh, became compulsory for Muslims in the second year of the Hijrah. Uh, that means that when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions migrated from Mecca uh, after suffering 13 years of persecution, when they migrated to Medina, uh, it was, uh, it, Ramadan did not become compulsory in the first year, but it was in the second year. And what this indicates is it's very interesting because now uh, the Muslim community guided by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a more stable situation. Uh, beyond that, now uh, the Muslims were living in an Islamic state. So we had this um, very beautiful new development whereby uh, Muslims were in a secure environment, at least a local secure environment, um, although they faced threats from the Quraysh of Mecca and there were you know, many attacks on the Muslims in Medina. But with respect to the, and the environment in Medina itself, uh, Muslims were living in a relatively safe environment and that they were living in an Islamic state. And so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made fasting for them obligatory. Even prior to this, Muslims used to fast, or the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast and his companions used to fast, but this was purely random, like there was no, no fixed days. Um, no, no determined days, no determined month, but in Medina in the second year of the Hijrah, it, the uh, fasting became compulsory in the month of Ramadan. Now, of course, Islamic calendar, uh, uh, you know, is based on the lunar cycle, mm -hmm. and so it goes with the sighting of the moon. And one other factor that I think is important to keep in mind is that uh, it was also in the month of Ramadan, in the second year of the Hijrah, that Muslims uh, went to participate in the Battle of Badr. And so, the Battle of Badr is a very, very important event in Islamic history because uh, Muslims were being tested, number one, with fasting, and number two, with, with to face a, an enemy, to defend themselves against an enemy that was far stronger, much better armed, and determined to destroy the Muslims. And yet here were a group of, a very small group of Muslims who were able to defend themselves against a much stronger enemy because now their taqwa was so strong that, you know, even with small numbers they were able to defend themselves. Now apart from fasting being divinely ordained for us, what are some of the other purposes or lessons that we can derive from Ramadan? The first and foremost is of course achieving taqwa. Uh, and again, uh, it is very important that our uh, viewers um, pay attention to this aspect because um, we are constantly striving in our life uh, to achieve taqwa because it is only then that we can uh, get guidance from the Quran and it is only then that we can achieve nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that sense, uh, achieving taqwa is also linked with fasting. So fasting also helps us to achieve taqwa. Now there are naturally other aspects as well and uh, part of achieving taqwa is to develop this sense of patience. Like you know we are going without food, without water for extended hours. Like you know here in, in Canada uh, we are going to be fasting for something like 16-17 uh, hours and it's not easy. Mm -mm. In addition 
uh, we don't get much time to rest. Right. Uh, you see, because um, if you look at it, like, you know, by the time we, we break fast uh, it, it, in the evening at about 8.42, um, uh, there is hardly an hour or so before we have to rush to Tarawi prayers, and that takes another hour and a half, and by the time we are finished with Tarawi prayers, it may be midnight. And so we come home to sleep at midnight, and we have to stop, stop uh, like, you know, get up for suhoor at 4 o'clock in the morning. So the maximum rest we get is only about four hours during the day right of course we can get some rest uh, later on during during the evening hours before the break of fast but uh, our sleep pattern is also affected because you know we don't get the full six seven eight hours of sleep whatever people are used to so it's a great test of our patience at the same time there is also a sense of um, appreciation that we must develop that there are people that are uh, poor there are people that are going hungry there are starving people around the world and we must develop a sense of empathy with them that we must understand their plight appreciate their plight and we should do our utmost to help them and I believe that as Muslims we have a great obligation that we should do uh, the most that we can do in order to help these poor and unfortunate people as our obligation no favor to the poor people in fact it is our obligation and we would get the benefit not the poor people because you know the reward that we get is from Allah so if we do it with that spirit that you know it is an obligation upon us to help poor and needy people then naturally we can look forward to the blessings of Ramadan and to the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what greater reward than the, than the rewards of Allah. Of course. Uh, walk us through what a day would be like during Ramadan from start to finish when we get up to after Maghrib. Yes. Um, you see, you know, what is, um, uh, we, we have to get up early in the morning before the break of dawn, which is referred to as suhoor. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that we should always make an effort to get up for suhoor because there are great blessings in it even though it is difficult because you know we are short of sleep and it, you know we can't get up we need to get rest but the Nabi Wasallam instructed us to get up for suhoor even if it is to let's say take a glass of water or a glass of milk before we go back to sleep although we shouldn't because you know that's the time when we really ought to be participating in ibadat uh, you know the ibadat at that time are really there is much greater reward at that time right. so we eat before the, the Fajr Azan. Now I want to mention something that uh, at times uh, Muslims become very, very particular and some people say that, well, you should stop eating 10 minutes before the Azan, etc. I don't think that there is any evidence for that from the Sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, he would always encourage his companions to continue, if let's say they were late getting up, that he would con uh, encourage them to continue eating while the azan was going on. Mm -hmm. So you don't stop, it's okay. I mean, you know, Islam allows that, that sort of, you know, leeway because the purpose is not to punish the individual. The purpose right. is to sort of develop that spirit in, in, in an individual so that we become uh, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to our listeners, to our viewers, those who are watching this program, if let's say they, they got up late and the azan was going on, they can continue eating until the end of the azan. So they shouldn't worry about this. Because, you know, it's the, the spirit behind the, 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 the act rather than the actual act itself. Obviously, right. it does not mean that people keep on eating until sunrise. <laughs> I mean, that's not the purpose. Secondly, I think we should always be conscious that we don't overeat. Right. Regrettably, in Ramadan, a lot of Muslims do that and that Big defeats problem. the purpose you know, both at suhoor time and much more unfortunately at iftar time. People, you know, pack up their, their plates, with, with pile up their plates, and I know we have seen this, that they can't even eat it, and then they throw that food away. And that's exactly the opposite of the spirit that we ought to be developing. Exactly. So we should eat less. And the purpose, of course, also is that no, when we eat less, it, uh, it actually helps our bodies. It's physically good for us. I mean, you know, doctors have said that when you fast, it helps to get rid of the toxins in your body. So there is no point in stuffing our bodies again with food and rebuilding those toxins. I mean, I'll tell you something. I have noticed and observed this, that uh, at times, for instance, when we had iftar programs over here and we had many more people, hundreds of more people come for iftar than we had uh, uh, you know, prepared for. And 
some of us went without food we just had maybe a cup of tea and a little bit of you know vegetables or fruit whatever i can tell you i felt so good that evening in the tarawih prayers and everything because the body was much lighter you see so if we practice this that we eat less i think it will help us much more and so we shouldn't over indulge ourselves we should be uh, trying to eat as light meals as possible and two or three other points that are very important that we must keep in mind which is the recitation of the quran uh, the you know the understanding of the quran participating in tarawih prayers and uh, developing that that sense of community belonging that those are very important things and in ramadan we must always strive to develop our character that's the purpose of ramadan that we develop right. our character that we must be patient we must not get angry we must be sort of you know much more tolerant of each other and so this ramadan i think if we make that effort that we become better human beings i think we would have achieved something and gained something from ramadan inshallah so you mentioned briefly about the tarawih prayers what exactly comprises that and when did muslims start or begin praying the tarawih prayer um now tarawih prayers um of course are not compulsory they are a sunnah uh, that means that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed that um and uh, we we pray tarawih prayers uh, at night um after we pray the isha fard salat and um the idea is that um we uh, recite the quran in in the tarawih prayers and in medina the the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam started this practice um when he would pray the tarawih prayers uh but he did not uh, make a, a compulsory prayer uh, like you know there are many uh, instances or there are episodes from his life uh, in which Uh, when he started praying the tarawih prayers some companions uh, saw him praying in the masjid and abwi they joined him then the next night also they joined him and the third night there were many companions in masjid and abwi but the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not come out to join them in tarawih prayers and the companions stayed until fajr prayers and when the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam came for fajr prayers he mentioned to them that yes i was aware that you are here I didn't join you because I was afraid that Allah might make tarawih prayers compulsory. They are not compulsory, they are not fard. So there is a difference. Um that there are some prayers that are called sunnah prayers and there are others that are uh, fard or faraid. Now tarawih are not fard prayers, but there's a lot of blessings in them because when we look at it, when Allah is enjoining us to uh, participate in more and more ibadat, then tarawih prayers offer us that opportunity. Secondly, if we listen to the recitation of the quran then again we are getting more blessings because this would lead us to understand the quran and therefore implement it in our lives so tarawih prayers are a very important part of the whole observance of the month of ramadan so we know that sometimes people get into you know disputes over how many rakats that we should actually be, be we should actually be praying during the tarawih some people say 8 some people say 20 what exactly is it both are correct the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed eight rakats and he also prayed 20 rakats uh but what i would uh, recommend to uh, our viewers our brothers and sisters is that whenever we participate in any acts of ibadah what we should be looking at is uh what is the maximum benefit that we get out of it Now let's look at the aspect that you know of course we uh, recite the noble Quran in the tarawih prayer so there is one juz or which, which we people from India and Pakistan refer to as one para okay now if let's say we were praying only eight rakats then either we would have to recite much more in each rakat of the eight rakats in order to complete one juz or one para or if we are praying the 20 rakats then usually there are in each juz or para about 20 or 22 rukus so that means that one ruku per uh, rakat can be recited which is much easier mm-hmm. and so we can complete one para or one juz in the 20 rakats of uh, tarawih prayers now the background to the 20 rakats is that of course this was um uh standardized by umar radhiyallahu anhu when he was the khalifa and the reason why he did that was because when he saw during his khilafa that muslims were sort of doing odd things different things 
uh, some were praying eight, some were praying 20, some were sort of, you know, there were all kinds of confusion. So he said, why don't we pray eight rakats, let's standardize it. I mean, sorry, why, not we, why don't we pray 20 rakats, let's standardize it and recite the Quran in these 20 rakats, so one juz, for over the 30 days you have completed your, your you know, 30 juzes or paras and recited, uh, completed the recitation of the Quran. So my recommendation to my brothers and sisters would be that we pray the 20 rakats so that it makes it easier to recite one juz each night and at the end of uh, the, the month of Ramadan that we have completed the recitation of the Quran. So over the past few years at the Islamic Society of York Region, we had uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr from Libya lead us in the Tarawi prayers. And as you know, the people who came here know he's a beautiful reciter. Will he be joining us again this year? Well, we very much hope so. Uh, we have sent out the uh, invitation letter to him. But as our viewers would know, um, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, turmoil in, each, in, in Libya, as, as there is in many other uh, countries in the Middle East. And the Canadian embassy in Libya is, has been shut down. But we have sent an invitation letter to him, and we are hoping that perhaps he can get his visa from the Canadian embassy in Tunisia. Uh, we are hopeful, but we cannot guarantee. Uh, we, pr we hope, inshallah, that he can join us, and that would be wonderful. Um, but if not, then we have obviously made alternative arrangements, and we will wait and see. We still have uh, a few days, so we will find out exactly what happens. Uh, but even if, uh, God forbid, he were unable to get his visa on time, uh, then what we have done over the previous years is that we have uh, recorded his entire recitation of the Quran. So we have uh, some of his um, uh, CDs and DVDs of the recitation available, and we can definitely uh, make those um, available um, to our brothers and sisters that they can benefit from. And we have, of course, other uh, CDs of his recitation as well uh, that, that we can utilize. Yes. Um, let's talk about the revelation of the Quran a bit more. We know that it was revealed over a period of 23 years. So please explain what it means uh, and its connection to the month of Ramadan. I think this is a very important question and I think our brothers and sisters ought to pay close attention. Uh, of course the Quran, the Quran says and Allah says in the Noble Quran that um, uh, it was revealed in the month of Ramadan. And as we know that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to go to the cave of Hira for meditation and, and uh, prayers. And it was at that time that the first revelation was received by him. Now, the aspect of revelation needs to be understood in two different contexts. The first is that the Quran exists in its um, form, which is what is the Quran itself refers to as in the form uh, on lahum mahfuz. So the lahum mahfuz, which means the well guarded tablet. Um, and that's the, uh, the Quran that existed with Allah. And so it was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was then sent down in its earthly form, the Quran that we have in our hands today. And in its entirety, it was sent down in the month of Ramadan but it wasn't all revealed at once. It was revealed over a period of 23 years. Although the first revelations were sent in the month of Ramadan to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the cave of Hira, and as we know, the first ayats, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Iqra Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalaq, those beautiful ayats, the five ayats, and those were revealed in the month of Ramadan. And then over a period of 23 years, uh, the Quran was revealed gradually so that it could be then implemented in the life of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as in the life of the society. So from the Lahun Mahfuz, the well-guarded tablet in the divine form, it was sent, the whole of it in its entirety, to in its earthly form in the month of Ramadan. And then the first revelation was in the month of Ramadan. And then gradually over a period of 23 years revealed to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you mentioned earlier, we should be trying to understand the Qur'an, gain a better understanding and more knowledge of it during the month of Ramadan. And we understand that Imam al-Asi is working on the first ever English tafsir of the Qur'an. So could you please tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you asked this question because, uh, you know, it is important for Muslims to understand that um, uh, we should, in addition to reading the Qur'an, 
in Arabic, we should also be trying to understand it. And unless and until we understand it, we are depriving ourselves of the larger blessings. Naturally, the Quran is Allah's revealed word and whether, um, you know, in whatever form we use it, read it, uh, we always get blessings. But isn't it better that we get more blessings by beginning to understand it? And uh, of course, uh, since most of us uh, in North America uh, may be not familiar with the Arabic language, what we need to do is to get a tafsir of the Quran that gives us the understanding of the Quran in its totality. Right. And I would say to my brothers and sisters who are watching this program that um, we cannot get uh, a complete understanding of the Quran simply by reading a translation. A trans obviously the Quran is Allah's word. You know, there, are, there is the context of revelation. There are background information related, the, the ayats relate to. And there are so many other historical uh, factors behind the revelation that we must become aware of in order to understand what the divine message of this book is. And that can only come to us from a tafsir. Now, Alhamdulillah, Imam Al-Asi has been working on this tafsir for many years. And we have already published four volumes of this tafsir. Mm. The fifth volume is in press. It should be coming out very shortly. And we will continue to produce these volumes of the tafsir as we go along. So I would strongly recommend to our brothers and sisters to get the tafsir, even if they get these four volumes that have been produced. And they, these four volumes or five volumes only take us up to the end of the five, fifth volume actually takes us up to the end of Surah Ali Imran. Wow. So Surah Al-Baqarah is covered in three volumes and Surah Ali Imran in two volumes. But they, they are so detailed and so well explained that if we understand, even if these two surahs of the Quran we understand properly, I am very confident and very comfortable in stating that inshallah Muslims would achieve tremendous benefit and they would become much more uh, aware of the message of the Quran and its content. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think is extremely important that we pay attention to. So I hope and pray, inshallah, that our brothers and sisters would um, uh, begin to engage the book of Allah in the way it ought to be engaged. Right. That we understand it and then we begin to implement it in our lives. And I, and I believe that Imam al-Asi's tafsir definitely helps us. Uh, and those who would like to get a cop or the, these copies of the tafsir, they can contact us. They have the information on their screen. Uh, they can either phone us at 905-887-8913 or email us at crescent at ca.inter.net. The information again is on their screen and they can get that information and these tafsir volumes we would be more than happy to make available to them with all the details of the costs and, and other uh, associated sort of uh, factors involved. Now, to wrap up our program, I'd just like to recap uh, some of the purposes and the lessons of Ramadan as a reminder to our viewers and for ourselves as well. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, Ramadan, uh, the fasting has been prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purpose is that we achieve taqwa, we develop patience, we develop this empathy with people less fortunate than ourselves, and that we engage the noble book of Allah so that we can implement it in our lives. So, inshallah, we can all uh, attain that this Ramadan. Thank you very inshallah. much, Brother Zafar, for being here. Thank you. Thank you to our viewers. We hope that this discussion is or will prove fruitful for you. Please join us next week on another episode of Muslim Perspectives. My name is Afifa Kawaja. Assalamu alaikum. The noble messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is revered and loved by all Muslims. But there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known. And that is the treaties he entered into, as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sira, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International. P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.